Well, today I'm speaking with Ben Painter. Ben is the co-founder of Whole School Mindfulness, an organization committed to putting mindfulness directors into schools. I really enjoyed my conversation with Ben. He's got a fascinating background and story, as well as an incredibly warm heart. Anyway, I hope you find something of value in this conversation. And now I bring you Ben Painter. I'm here with Ben Painter. Ben, thanks for joining me. Hey, John. Yeah, thanks for having me. Of course. Now, I think we first met at the Wisdom 2.0 conference in San Francisco, right? Yeah, we met at, I think it was like the after party. The, yes. After the last at a night. Bar. Around yeah. a pool table. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Some darts and pool table. Yeah. yeah man, that you, was, I, was, I was about to do a Lock Kelly retreat, and I feel like you were with a crew that were all Lock Kelly people. And so we became fast friends, and yeah. I, got, I got excited for it. Yeah. And I mean, really, I just was fascinated in your history. But yeah, before I want to get into that, but how about we start with you just giving us a potted background, spiritual, emotional, intellectual. Tell us a bit about yourself and your history. Yeah, sure. So I grew up in Sudbury, Massachusetts, which is a suburb outside of Boston. And uh, yeah, I went to the public school system there until high school. And in high school, I went to a uh, a prep school called Middlesex, which is in Concord, Massachusetts. It's a boarding school, but I was a day student. And at that school, they made the really cool decision of having mindfulness be a pretty core part of what they offered there. So there was a full-time director of mindfulness. So kind of got interested in, yeah, it was really amazing. And, and the mindfulness director there, Doug, still kind of one of my main role models, mentors, teachers today. And so got very interested in mindfulness and contemplative practice at that point. Ended up going to Bowdoin College, but before I went to Bowdoin College, just kind of like a small liberal arts college in Maine, my best friend and I did a year off where we did a combination of working and travel. And we spent three months in Nepal and got to spend some more intensive time in retreat with some amazing monks there. And uh, yeah, then went on to Bowdoin College, retreats maintained, uh, continued to be a, a pretty big part of what I did throughout college. Majored in government and legal studies, which is essentially kind of like a pre-law track and minored in art. And cool. then went on to the nonprofit space. So I, I worked for a venture philanthropy firm right out of college called New Profit, which essentially helps nonprofits, especially kind of justice and equity focused nonprofits get to the next level through a combination of a bunch of unrestricted capital and then a multitude of other supports. And I was on the fundraising team there and then had the opportunity to switch over and help get this organization called Whole School Mindfulness going, which we're, we're working to meaningfully integrate mindfulness into our education system by normalizing slash legitimizing this position of a mindfulness director as a normal part of a school. So somebody whose role it is to introduce mindfulness to the students, faculty, and staff. We want to help create meaningful proof points that model can be effective. And yeah, I've been doing that since 2020. Wow. Yeah. Incredible work. I want to unpack all of that and it seems all interrelated. So let's maybe yeah. start to, with your first kind of introduction to mindfulness. What did that look like? You're, so you're in high school, you said, right? I'm in high school. And, you know, when I say prep school in Concord, Massachusetts, probably whatever mental image you have is right. <laughs> you know, it's <laughs> like po polo, sh polo shirts and well-manicured lawns. And yeah, <laughs> yeah, it was, it was that type of environment. And yeah, I'm incredibly okay. grateful for that experience. It really, the, the educational offering there was so amazing. Like the average class size or something, it was 12. The discussions oh, were wow. amazing. And there was a very, athletics was a big part of the culture. And I was a big boy. <laughs> and I remember, so we had a three season sport requirement our freshman and sophomore year. And freshman year, I didn't really have a fall sport that seemed like a good fit. I didn't want to do cross country or soccer. I think I had, I was a little bit afraid of like running at that point. <laughs> so I did football and I was a lineman on the football team and it was a small school and, uh, the, it was small enough that the 
kind of junior varsity, which I was on at the time, was the practice squad for the varsity. So I ended up getting a very major concussion or kind of set of concussions just because the person I was up against every play of every practice was oh, this no. massive, you know, 275 pound football college going guy. And so I was in this pretty intense academic environment with a pretty major concussion and worried about, you know, how am I going to do academically here without not being at full capacity. So that my initial motivation for mindfulness was actually kind of a combination of wanting to, I associated mindfulness with kind of helping with academic performance okay, and memory, focus, attention, that kind of thing. And then also there was this guy who was just kind of around <laughs> and it was as the program. The director. Was, yeah, this director okay. guy. And this was early days in the program. Now he has a room dedicated to mindfulness and it's beautiful and it's really integrated into the curricula in such a way that all freshmen take mindfulness kind of one-on-one class. But so this director it wasn't, really demonstrated the value of what he had to offer. Yes, yes. But when I was there, it wasn't a required thing. It was yeah. more optional. And so I just noticed this guy, he hung around where I like to study and he was so nice. He embodied like this flavor of masculinity that was new to me because okay. he, on one hand, he was the athletic hall of fame in our high school. He was an alumni, one who's kind of like the best known as the best athlete to have ever gone to our high school. So he checked a lot of those boxes for me, but he was also just like so kind, so warm, receptive, gentle. gentle. So I kind of just like, was like, hey, what's this guy all about? So I started kind of hanging out with him and took his first class. And then I'll, I'll say as my final part of the motivation, I had some family members growing up that suffered with kind of severe depression and anxiety. And I knew that meditation was helpful for them. I didn't really do yeah. meditation with them because I was pretty, pretty little. But I think in the back of my head, I just had like this idea that these things can support well-being. So I, I think I was just open and receptive and had the right teacher and the right environment. And yeah, ended up taking his class in mindfulness as a sophomore in high school. And did you have any religious background or did you come from a secular home? What did that look like? Yeah, no, I did not grow up with any real religion. We maybe went to, I think if you were to ask me, do you identify as anything? Maybe I would have said Unitarian growing up, okay. but we only went to church a couple times. God was not in the discussion. Yeah, it, it wasn't really a thing in my family growing up. Uh, so neither of my parents are very religious people or. Yeah, so that that was new to me. And then I'd also say, you know, mindfulness at Middlesex was introduced in a very secular way. It, it I think there might have been mention of the roots and honoring of the lineage of the practice, but in itself was pretty, yeah, if it wasn't secular, it wouldn't have landed well in that context, to be honest. Sure. So he did it in a way that did not feel religious at all at that time. Okay. So you begin this practice, uh, you kind of have a beginner's mind, you're open, receptive. And yep. so what happened that you've made a career out of it? So something that's <laughs> really landed. Yeah, I, th I think a few things happened. I think right off the bat, I wasn't like, oh my gosh, sitting down and meditating is life changing. And that was not my initial experience. Sure. But it was really, I think, I, A, I wanted to hang out more with this guy who just like became a mentor and a role model for me. And I yeah. just kind of wanted to see what he was about. So that kind of like me looking up to Doug was a big part of it. Mm. Then I really liked the community that would form around it. I think that was honestly an initial draw to me. Like, you know, I'm, I think I'm kind of a, one thing I'm curious about is how the medium of connection influences the culture of a thing. So yeah. for example, with football, you know, there are parts of the elements of being on the football team that were so positive for me. Like, you, it felt like I had a group of brothers, like we would go yeah. out there, we would go to battle together, essentially, in the sense of camaraderie and like having each other's back off yeah. the field was very strong. Community. But 
yeah, community. But I also think it's, I like, you know, before practices and before games, I would essentially do the opposite of a love and kindness practice. <laughs> I would imagine <laughs> the first war. Thing, yeah, yeah, I was preparing for war. And I would imagine, I remember like, I had like a warm up song, which was Chop Suey by System of a Down, which is just like <laughs> anger, aggression. Yeah. And I would imagine the person as like less than human. So I could like really beat them play after play. Mm. And uh, I think that also impacted the culture, right? Like on and off the field, I think that sometimes those more aggressive sports, not always, but can have a more kind of like violence or aggression yeah. off the field as well. Yeah. No and doubt. so just the idea of people coming together to really earnestly just get curious about what it means to be human together, practice things like gratitude and compassion together. I think I was attracted to the cultures built around that as just a really awesome compliment and communities that I wanted to be part of. Yeah. And especially and then, the contrast a lot of men have historically, that's an uncomfortable situation to kind of be vulnerable around other people or men. And here you are kind of yeah, exploring things like gratitude. And so, yeah, that's interesting contrast there, but sorry, go ahead. No. Yeah, totally. Totally. It, it, it was. And, and I just really want to double down on having this teacher that this wasn't theoretical and it wasn't even taught with his words. It just kind of happened via osmosis almost like the, he, yeah. he was embodying these things, you know? Yeah. And I think, yeah, I, I, I looked up to that a lot. And uh, yeah, let me, is it, sorry, let me jump in there. Cause I, the first time I really understood that there were other ways of teaching outside of the intellectual or conceptual zone. Mm. I went to Peru and met the ship people who are the protectors of the Amazon rainforest and also ayahuasca, the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. sacred medicine. But I remember just vividly it hitting me just like a brick. Oh, there is another way to be. I don't even speak the same language as uh, these people, but they are imparting so much wisdom on on me. Yeah. And so, yes, this it sounds like this teacher embodied qualities that your heart was interested in or attracted to. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, it's okay. Yeah. And then I think the more I practiced, the more I actually started to notice the benefits of the practice. So I think right off the bat, it was helpful for kind of more performancey things like uh, focus, memory, attention for academic success. Sure. But then I think also it, it just kind of made me more curious about my mind and how it worked. And I found the investigation and the structure and support in investigating my mind as helpful to me, not just when I was in, in school doing academic things, but in my relationships, in, in just when stress would happen, when good moments would happen, just I started to notice kind of the benefits of the practice, I would say. And then, oh yeah, and I'll also say like also kind of supported me as a leader and I think gave me frameworks as a leader as well. Leadership was something I was this this high school gate had a lot of opportunities for leadership and uh, thinking about what it means to be a leader. And the practice was a grounding thing for me in that leadership. I was the president of that high school, kind of the student body president. And you okay. give this big speech at the end of your time, at the end of senior year. And it's kind of like how the year wraps up as the student body president gives a speech. And I think that was one of the first times actually that the whole school meditated together. I had Doug lead a little meditation wow. before that talk I gave. And now they meditate together every week. It's like part of the culture. But I think one of the first times was we called it, we had, it was a non-religious place, but interestingly enough, it was called chapel. My chapel started with a guided meditation and yeah, it was just kind of something I was proud to represent and proud to do. Yeah. And uh, help form community around. Yeah, cool. So the practices it was introduced to you, was it 
a stripped down modified version of the boss well, yeah i, mean, I think what? that's a that's an accurate way of saying it yeah okay so what did the instruction kind of look like what yeah i, I would say a lot of it would be anchor based practices so kind of cultivating that kind of john kabat-zinn style definition of mindfulness based yeah. around you know paying attention on purpose to the present moment with an attitude of kindness curiosity openness receptiveness so using different anchors in order to cultivate, you know, the stability of mind in order to do that. And so different anchors could include, you know, our five senses, uh, felt sense of the body, felt sense of the body, breathing, seeing, uh, hearing, smelling, tasting, etc. As you go to advanced courses with Doug, you can also start to play with the anchor of thinking, which I think is a difficult practice, but you do a little yeah. bit of that. Um, cool more open awareness practices of just kind of investigating the container with which within which all these different mental phenomenon path through loving kindness practice was a big thing he would teach concentration based practices and then he did teach things like mindfulness for athletics hmm. and then i got the, into this a little bit later with doug's help actually and now it's a pretty big part of what it means to be educated there, but there's also kind of like mindfulness informed communication. So learning like nonviolent communication skills. So Ooh, thinking about using mindfulness to identify needs, separating needs from strategies, having a framework of thinking about kind of navigating the world and interpersonal relationship with this lens of mindful awareness, essentially. Cool. Huge for leaders. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Cool. Are you familiar with Diane Musho Hamilton? No. She does a lot of, she's a famous mediator but has a Zen background. Oh, there you go. But yeah, I bring that up just for your line of work. I highly recommend, yeah, you introduce yourself to her. Maybe have a conversation. Yeah, I'll check her out. Okay, so you've been introduced to Vipassana, and now we've hit graduation. And you yeah. mentioned earlier that you took a year off between high school and college yeah so my best what? friend at the time and my best friend to this day i'm getting married in september and he's gonna be my best man his name's john luke and he was also a meditator also kind of like one of doug's a lover of and yeah we decided to both go to Bowdoin together and we decided it's to liberal take liberal arts school in maine yes yes liberal arts school in maine and we, yeah, we decided to take a year off together first and just do some adventuring and some exploring. His parents did gap years and found it very influential. My big brother did a gap year. And yeah, we had the time and opportunity and Bowdoin said yes. And so we kind of broke it up into three phases. First, we did the buy that year rail pass. So it's the you essentially buy a a pass that lets you go on most trains in Europe for free once you have cool. the pass. Sure. And uh, we just did a few months of just bumming around Western Europe, basically trying to stay wherever we could find a free place to stay. A couch or a hostel. Yeah. We actually didn't do many hostels. It was more so we would hit up one family friend or a, a friend from camp or John Luke's dad did a lot of traveling back when he was in college. So we stayed with a lot of the same people that he stayed with and wow. their kids and then we'd stay with people and kind of ask, hey, you got any friends that might want to put us up for a couple of days? And I think cool. there was just like this sense of supporting these two young guys out on an adventure. So we stayed in, you know, kind of less nice, nice, I'm putting in air quotes places, like sharing a pullout couch that was meant for a, a child kind of thing. And then we also got, would get passed around and stayed in a castle on the countryside of Germany wow. with an actual German princess hosting us. And yeah, it was just such a fun adventure, especially after, you know, being in a fairly intense environment with Middlesex. It was just like so much freedom. Yeah. I feel those gap years are huge to get to know yourself. You learn a lot that you can't learn in a classroom just by... Exploring totally. new cultures, meeting new people, testing the limits of your comforts and <laughs> safety. Yes. And, yeah. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I think travel is, and I 
total in what you were reflecting too with your experience in Peru, I think it can reveal to you just that all these mental constructs that we have and the ways we navigate the world, which feel automatic to the point that I think we're blind to them. Totally. It can just reveal to you that there's another way of thinking about things, another way of being, and uh, maybe even a better way, <laughs> maybe a totally. way that would feel more aligned if you were to try it on a little bit. That, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Greek philosophy, but Herodotus tells this story in his histories about the Persian king Darius, okay, who has some Greeks living under his rule at the time, and he asked this group of Greeks how much money it would he would convince them to eat their fathers when they died hmm. and the greeks like freaked out it's their tradition to burn their dead and so then king darius calls over the collations whose burial tradition is in fact to eat their dead and hmm. he asks them how much money it would take to convince them to burn their fathers when they died and they hmm. freaked out yeah. So, yeah, exploring different cultures really highlights or makes you face some of these dogmas that we just kind of accept as truths, and it opens you up. Oh, there's actually multiple possibilities here. So, yes, yeah. it is a very opening experience, travel. Totally. Yeah, yeah. You're making, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you're making me think of, you know, so many great meditation teachings and mindfulness teachings and teachings in general are taught through metaphor. And one of the metaphors that really sticks with me or has stuck with me is this idea of sledding. Okay. And like, you know, when you go sledding, I know you're in Utah, so I know you, you have snow My out My kids there. are sledding right now. <laughs> yeah. <It's a> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like you can, you know, you sled in a track and the more that you go in the mm. same track, kind of the walls build up around you. Totally. Yeah. And the metaphor is that like our mind has these tracks. Right. And the walls of our tracks are so steep that we actually don't even know we're in a track. Totally. And there's just so many automatic things that our minds do as we go about our day and react to different things, etc. And I think what mindfulness can help us do is just like look around and notice that there are walls. Yeah. Uh, and then there are also practices and things we can do that snow, <laughs> make it snow. <laughs> and yeah. you can then make the decision to hop back right in the same track or try a different track, you know, but it's the ability to pause and notice what's happening that gives you the freedom to even have that choice. Um, yes. Freedom there know. is a huge word for me because you can look at uh, what mindfulness practice offers in several different terms, awakening, enlightenment, freedom understanding freedom though i think captures something very important and it is this because like you said with the sled metaphor we are habitual creatures mm -hmm. there's causes and conditions that lead us to where we are and those grooves just deepen over time those neural pathways strengthen and mindfulness in its non-reactivity it's open receptiveness of the moment, not leaning forward or pulling back. Yeah. It, it really does open up space for us to navigate the world with discerning wisdom. So we can see that habit, see that impulse or tendency and to not engage. Or like you said, if it's something that we do find beneficial, wholesome, skillful, and oh, actually we can engage, but without that element of mindfulness or that equanimity or equipoise, yeah, we often don't have freedom. We're stuck in yeah. our habitual tendencies, so. Yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you've got this gap year. Does your yep. practice continue throughout this period or did you kind of step back? Yeah, I, th I think probably continued in a fairly light way. Not as intense during the that section of it, I would say, the bumming around Europe <laughs> section. Yeah. But I'm sure we did some meditating. I don't remember how much, to be honest. And then after the Europe thing, we worked. So we worked. Well, hold on. So at, at yeah. this point during your gap year, 
you had how many years of practice in mindfulness? Would have been three at that point. Okay. So had you established a habit? Uh, yeah. Because, I mean, for me at least, the goal with meditation is a lot of people kind of have these hard walls between formal practice and the rest of their life. But it's like, yeah. m my goal is to dissolve that line more and more. So it's a continuous thing, it's oh, a yeah. way of life, not a formal practice. Mm -hmm. And because we are habitual creatures, we can make mindfulness the tendency of mind. Did Was that your experience? Was it more of a everyday or habitual tendency for you at that point? Mm. Yeah, I think I'm definitely still learning how to do that. Sure. And that's what actually one thing I, too, I, yeah, yeah, I totally appreciate about Locke Kelly is like the small glimpses many times kind of approach of just like, it can just be a small little reorientation that happens right now. Totally. You know? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I think I was on my way, uh, you know, I was on that path that like that concept was something I was trying to embody at that point. Yeah. The concept of the life practice rather than formal periods. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And because cool. that was always how it was taught to us from the get go. Oh, cool. Was this meditation practice that you're doing is a way to practice. Like, that's why it's called practice. Right. Um, it's the point is not to be a rock star while you're sitting down alone or in a circle with other people. The point is when you're off the cushion, how do you bring it off the cushion? That was always right. the framing. Cool. And I think is really important for that to be the framing. Right. You know, it doesn't work unless it works and you're having yeah. a difficult conversation with your partner or a loved one, you know, or a boss or. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Um, cool. Okay. So sorry, I, I interrupted. No, no. So you're moving on after your gap year, you're now going to uh, university. Yeah. Well, we're like one third of the way through the gap year now. And I'll breeze through the second phase. We worked. We got a chance of, to like experience the nine to five. We worked oh, for a, okay. a bulk gluten-free starch distributor in, distributor in Gloucester, New Jersey. <laughs> oh, cool. My... Twin girls have celiacs, so. Okay, there you go. Yeah. Way to go. So, so yeah, we, we, we worked for a company where, you know, if you need like five pallet loads of tapioca starch <laughs> to manufacture your gluten-free pet food or whatever, we were helping with that. And then we went to Nepal. So that, that first period of Nepal was in the year off. Cool. And uh, we did this through, so the first two sections were kind of unstructured, just us doing it on our, on our own. The Nepal section we did through a program called Where There Be Dragons, which is kind of like a gap year program. So we had, there was a group of like 10 or 13 of us with a few kind of counselors, mentors um, who spoke the language knew the area and there was kind of different segments to support our time there. So it was a combination of kind of like cultural immersion. So being in homestays with families in Nepal, language learning. So we, there were periods where we had a couple hours of Nepali language class a day. And there was a period where you can kind of do an independent project while we were living in Kathmandu. And I love cooking. So I did cooking. And so I actually got like a part-time gig working in a Momo shop, which oh. is kind of like a Nepali dumpling. So I would fold Momos. So that was a lot of fun. And then there was, and the reason why we did this program was there was a pretty intensive retreat, contemplative practice section as well. So we did a few different retreats and the most influential was with in in a place called Drupadrong, which is in the north. It's kind of north, slightly northeast of Kathmandu, deep in the kind of in the mountains. And we were working with these Tibetan monks practicing a Tibetan Buddhism, and 
our teacher monk who's named Lama Sherab is was just amazing. Like talking about it's going back to like the it's not about the words you say necessarily, it's just how you show up. Like yeah. This guy I don't know how to describe him. He's just being around him is infectious. Yeah. Just his laughter, his smile, going on walks with him in the woods. Like this sounds is this, wild. Is this the guy with the big key? It's the guy with the big key. Okay, yeah. I'll, to, I'll tell that story. Share the story yeah. <laughs> and you know, in that area of Buddhism, there's this retreat that you can do that's three months, three years, three weeks. Okay. Of of intense retreat. And he was in his mid thirties at the time and had already done two of those and a kind of a bunch of retreats leading up to this. So he'd spent, wow. you know, 10 years plus in very intense retreat. Wow. And he was in his mid thirties and you could tell <laughs> like he was just an amazing figure to be around. Radiating and, uh, love and kindness. And yes. A, a caring and just attention. incredibly inspiring for us as y- young guys who were, interested in meditation, thinking about how this is going to be incorporated into our lives, like seeing someone who had really dedicated their life to it within the context of a culture that's really supportive of that. And just how free and happy you can be (laughs) was really amazing. With so little. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, When it comes to like, yeah, monetary, financial and the living situation was rustic, you know, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. The story with the key is I have a few like kind of core memories of this guy, Lama Sherp at that time. One memory before the key story is we were meditating one day and I think he could tell that the group was getting like a little restless or something. And so he was like, all right, we got to go move our bodies a little bit. So we set up this cricket game. It was all these American kids that didn't know how to play cricket. So he was kind of like (laughs) explaining the rules to us and his English was pretty good, but not that good. (laughs) And I just remember... He hits the cricket ball and he's running back and forth and uh, just yelling compassion <laughs> as, he's, as he's running the bases. Um, that's one core memory I have. And then another core memory I have is one day. So in that moment, he knew what everyone needed and he yeah. uplifted all of you. Okay. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Cool. Another memory I have is. One day he said, hey, I want, to go, I want to show you guys something. It was kind of the morning of one of our, after one of our sitting periods. And we went on a hike in the mountains off the, near the retreat center where we were staying. And uh, we're going up, we're going up, we're going up. And then we get to kind of like this big cliff, pretty striking view of the Himalayas. And in the face of this kind of like there's a, uh, a wall and in the face of this wall there's this big red door indiana jones temple. that that style yeah yeah okay cool <laughs> it was just like oh my gosh we, we were just on cloud nine we we're like we're with llama sheriff it, there's this beautiful day we're going on a hike and he's in his robes and uh, we get to this door and he pulls well, he out. he told like, me as he's walking through the forest, it's almost like all the animals are coming out. Yeah, <laughs> saying hi to him. Yeah. <laughs> it really did feel like that. Yeah. yeah. And uh, he pulls out this big key. Like, I don't know how to describe. Like comedically a kind of a big. Comedically big key. And he takes this key and he opens this door and it's inside as a cave. And as we go in to sit in this cave and he lights not just one incense, but bundles of incense. Like we're kind of hot boxing this cave <laughs> with incense. And he starts to chant and tell us about all these amazing masters who did their three year, three month, three week sit throughout time in this cave and got enlightened in this cave. Wow. And we're chanting and we're sitting and it was just like, oh my gosh. It was, yeah, it was one of the coolest memories I have. Just energetically affable, but yes, yes. Wow. With this group who we, everyone in this group was kind of in a transition period in their life. Like I think these gap year programs kind of attract it's people taking a year off before college or they just dropped out of college because it wasn't for them. And 
they're in a transition thinking, what are they going to do with their life? Or they got suspended <laughs> and they're doing a, kind of this as a kind of like, who am I going to be in this world type moment? And so we're all young, impressionable in this kind of period of being, I think, maybe uniquely open. Infinite possibilities in front of you. Yeah. And yeah, uh, yeah it, was incred- it was incredibly impactful for me that time and got to do it with my best friend. So like I had... Who's going to be your best man at your wedding? Yes. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it was really special time. And yeah, f- to just to fast forward and get a little bit darker, while we were there, Nepal had kind of a once in a hundred year earthquake, a uh, mm-hmm. very high ma- magnitude earthquake, eight point something, I think, seven point something oh. or eight point something. And it's a logarithmic scale. So, you know, a 5.0 earthquake is 10 times more than a 4.0 earthquake. So, yeah, just for folks in California who, who say like, oh, I, I've had an earthquake that I was X. Just think about it was 10 or 100 Magnitude. or 1,000 times yeah. bigger. <laughs> yeah. And with Nepal's infrastructure situation, which was not earthquake resistant, you know, most buildings especially right. in the more rural areas and the trails and everything. So it was, we're, yeah, susceptible to collapse. And we were just lucky that we were at a, we were just kind of, it was near the tail end of our trip. We'd done our retreat. Our hearts were wide open. And uh, yeah, we were on a hike one day, thankfully. And uh, because we were outdoors when it happened. So you felt it. Yeah. Yeah, we felt it. Was that your first um, experience in an earthquake? Anything near that, for yeah. sure. Yeah. It, it was like, I don't know how long, 60 seconds, 90 seconds of kind of just a rolling sensation. And we were in the forest. And before it happened, the forest just went alive. Mm. Like before we could feel it, I think the animals felt it. Yeah. And it, it just like, it was, everyone was just like stopped and looked at each other and and we're just like, what is going on? And then um, um, the kind of thing where you would stabilize against a tree or else you would fall over type yeah. kind of oh. quaking. And yeah, it was a weird time. And it was an intense time. We didn't have phones or internet or TV. So I think I remember looking at John Luke and just kind of having like a moment of locking eyes and being like, we're going to live like whatever it needs whatever we need to do type thing. But in reality, we weren't in much physical danger just because we were lucky to be outside. And um, yeah, then we didn't really know the extent of the destruction and the loss of life for a few days. So there's just kind of this weird, giddy, like, like I think the group kind of didn't know how to channel the feelings we were feeling so we were kind of like giddy and jokey and avoidant almost for a couple days sure yeah and then i remember we were at this campground because there are still aftershocks so you still would want to be outdoors so we were sleeping outside in our tents we were at this campground and went into this kind of restaurant that had tv and the first time we saw just the absolute destruction and we, it and was just for, this sobering moment, yeah. For people that, that maybe haven't sat retreat, your heart really, like you said, opens and it's tender. So yeah. when an emotion arises, like compassion it is felt and it's felt deeply. It, you're tender. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Your ability to like numb out <laughs> is, is less than... Yes. <laughs> And uh, yeah, it was a hard moment of just seeing that and hearing about the loss of life. And we did this homestay program in a village called Barawa um, not too long before, a few weeks before. And we learned from our instructors that half the folks in Barawa had died. So a lot of the people that, a lot of the families that we'd been staying in their homes and Mm -hmm. they're, yeah, incredibly welcoming and generous with us. So yeah, it was a difficult moment and we were at this program, right? So they were kind of sorting out how to get all these American kids home, essentially. Like 
even coordinating with the kind of U.S. embassy there. And John Luke and I had this moment of being like, hey, we're able-bodied guys. We're here. We got to find some way to help our volunteer or something. And the, our program was not driving with that plan. So we were kind of like, all right, we're going to drop out of the program. And uh, our mentor sat us down, our kind of the Where There Be Dragon staff who had been helping to organize this whole thing sat us down and said, hey, guys, like this is super well-intentioned, but uh, you don't speak Nepali that well. You don't have medical training. You still have an American stomach, even though you've been here for a few months. The reality of what's going to happen is you're going to drink some bad water or something. You're going to get sick. And you're going to, because you're American, you're going to take up a hospital bed that could have gone to someone else. Mm -hmm. So leave. <laughs> and I think he was right. Like, there, I think the inequities, when disaster strikes, the inequities that are facing everybody or, you know, just the reality for so many people really become apparent. Like there were something mm -hmm. like 11 or 12 helicopters. I heard this. It could be a little bit off, but I think the gist of it is right in Nepal at that time. And a large percentage of them went to Everest because people had, that's where a lot of international folks were that had the insurance that if disaster strikes, they get the helicopter. So, you know, mm. just in terms of the strategic allocation of resources in a disaster sure. situation, like they disproportionately went to folks who were not Nepali. Interesting. And, yeah. Sad. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, it was just this moment of feeling like, Fuck, <laughs> like yeah. helpless, not able to help, burdensome in the way, survivor's guilt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we ended up staying on the lawn of the American embassy, which was a pretty wild experience because it was like oh. all the Americans were flocking to the American embassy and kind of supplies were getting shipped in with kind of search and rescue teams. So like we were hanging out with like the L.A. search and rescue crew and their dogs that flew over to help with the rescue efforts. And then, yeah, and then we went home and got a summer job as a bartender at a country club. It was a wild yeah. kind of like transition back. Yeah, I found that to be the case without a disaster like that. You know, you go on a mm -hmm. week, 10-day retreat, whatever. That transition back home has typically been rough for me. Yeah, it's a lot. You know, your heart is very sensitive. The noise is a lot, the stimulation and you're moving a little bit slower. So you come and talk to family or friends and it's like you're moving at this very slow pace. <laughs> <laughs> uh, totally. Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. But then your heart was also just kind of torn apart there at the end. And then all of a sudden yeah. you're back to your daily life you know you're working you're in a bar yes that's, yeah that's yeah. interesting yeah yeah and i think you know our loved ones back home i think we're just really glad to have us come back yeah um, i'm sure luckily we were with we had or at least our counselors i don't i forget what they were called mentor type figures on the program they were able to contact kind of hq and HQ. let everybody HQ. at home like the where they be dragons headquarters and let them know we're all safe. So our parents got the word pretty quickly. Earthquake in Nepal was the news and they had a text. Everybody's okay. Or an email. Everybody's okay. But there was another where there be dragons group that was actually like right at the epicenter and there was no service. And they, so for days or weeks, the parents back home and the families back home didn't hear anything. Wow. And they were literally hiding in a cave as boulders the size of minivans were just tumbling around them. Yeah. So relatively to this other group, the communication was much better. And yeah, so I was, you know, going home was a mix of emotions, but there was some like happiness and ease to go home and, you know, go back to comfort and our loved yeah. ones and my girlfriend then is now my fiance. I've been mm -hmm. dating my middle school sweetheart. Yeah. <laughs> so going back to her was really great. And yeah, then we 
started Bowdoin, got that there was a little bit of a mindfulness kind of community going at Bowdoin, but not a ton. So me, me, John Luke, and a couple other folks at Bowdoin got this mindfulness club going. And that was a big part of my experience there. The outing club was a big part of my experience there. And then that next summer, I had the opportunity to go back to Nepal. And that was the coolest and wildest job I ever had. So there was... In Nepal, yep. So the job was, I was working on a payment team of a trail reconstruction nonprofit. So the British Mm -hmm. government funded, there was a bunch of reconstruction that needed to be done and trail reconstruction was a big one, especially in the rural areas. The trails are how people get to school. They're how you get to to the next town, market access, et cetera. So the economies were devastated and there are these, places that were trying to rebuild that had no way of getting supplies and materials to them. So this organization funded by the British government said, Hey, anybody who wants to show up for a day of work, able-bodied or not, you'll get paid. And we're going to rebuild these trails in a way that's a bit more earthquake resilient. And so I was with a few Nepali guys who worked for this organization and we were backpacking from village to village paying the people who were doing the trail, the local folks who were reconstructing the the trails. And so we were backpacking with tens of thousands of dollars in our backpack. Wow. uh, In cash. (laughs) Oh my gosh. (laughs) And yeah, and it was intense and it was active landslide season. Like you'd Mm -hmm. go on a trail and then you'd stop and get some tea and go back on that same trail and new giant boulders were on that trail that weren't there before. Yeah, it was scary. It was intense. And I was like the intern. <laughs> so it would be my job to babysit the backpack while my bosses would go drink <laughs> at nighttime. Oh, <laughs> uh, wow. Uh, yeah, it was super fun. And it was a uh, shout out to Bowdoin College. It was my Bowdoin College. Like they have like a unpaid internship program. So they compensated me and allowed oh, cool. for that travel and everything. And while I was there, I also, once that gig ended, got to go back to the monastery with Lama Sherup and mm-hmm. make a fundraising video, kind of like a little profile on Lama Sherup and the work they do in the retreat center and the religious, spiritual, historical significance of that place. And then do a little bit of like, hey, we need X amount of money to rebuild this place, get, get it back so our practitioners aren't, aren't sleeping in tents and rebuild the the temple and the stupa. So that was really not full closure, but really helpful just to be able to go back and feel like yeah, I was maybe a little bit useful to somebody. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's cool that you had the chance to come back the following summer. And then, yeah, my timeline's like a little off, but somewhere in there so, early in. Yeah. Well, while you were there for your second trip, did you sit retreat at all? Or was it? Well, a little bit, not really. I was really worked like I had a job. Yeah. yeah. So, but while I was with Lama Sherp filming the documentary, we did get to do some practice together. Cool. But yeah, not like any like five day, seven day type sure. thing. But it was around that time of getting back and uh, I'll have to look at my notes to remember when my first retreat was, but that's when I started doing retreat with this organization called Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. Okay. Which is a retreat organization. Basically what they do is, and their name is just in the process of changing to Inward Bound Mindfulness for anyone who Googles it. So Inward Bound Mindfulness Education or Inward Bound Mindfulness. I'm sure their SEO still works for both. They are an amazing organization that run in-depth, deep, high quality retreats for young people. So basically like 15 to 19 years old. That's crazy. Um, and I, we did our first retreat with them, I think our freshman year of college. And we've heard a lot about it because at the time, our mindfulness teacher, Doug, his wife, Jessica Mori, who is a badass, amazing Dharma mindfulness teacher, was actually leading that organization. We've heard about it a bunch and we finally did our first one with them. 
And that's like a six day retreat for young people where you're meditating or in practice like five hours a day. There are periods of noble silence, but there's also periods of really amazing kind of mindful, intentional relating. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been doing those retreats and now kind of like staffing. activities where you're working together, kind of fun, engaged project. Yeah. yeah. You're, you're, it'll, like the schedule is something like there are periods of meditating. There's periods of small group where you're talking about meditating and doing kind of like mindful relating activities. There's this one activity in particular called, called hot seat or sweet seat that I think you'd really like. And then there's also you're eating what's meals. The, what's the idea of this? The Hot seat or sweet seat is basically, and my friend group still does this actually. It's a group meditation where, and it's pioneered by this guy named Marv Belzer. It's a group meditation where the group comes in to practice together. And then one person who volunteers is then kind of becomes the anchor of the attention for the group. So let's say you're with a group of 10 people and I was on the seat that day. Everyone would kind of physically orient themselves to me and kind of like the common meditation instruction, like when you notice your mind has wandered off, like you would reorient your attention back mm -hmm. to me and the group is in silence together until someone has natural, true, authentic curiosity about my experience or me mm. story. And then there's this form where if you have that happen, someone raises their hand, a facilitator calls on them. They ask their question. I can answer, not answer, pass, whatever. And then the only response is thank you from the mm. questioner. And then that process repeats. So it's question, answer, thank you. Question, answer, thank you. Question, answer, thank you. And there's no like, there's no nodding. There's no like those, even those like kind of subtle ways we like encourage. It's really just the idea is open, receptive listening. And the idea with the questions is I think sometimes in an interview or in a conversation, we're, we're, listening with the intention to respond or we're asking to the with the intention of filling silence or we're asking with the intention of even trying to get them to see something about themselves like it's not our curiosity it's like we want them to change right but the invitation here is just to lean into curiosity i do love that yeah. wow and you know you look at kids and really everyone one of our deepest needs is just to be seen, felt, heard, understood. And so this is an opportunity to just smother someone with a caring yeah. attention. Yeah. Uh -huh. How uh -huh. wonderful. Yes. And it's happening within this container of people sometimes for the first time, like meditating five hours a day for a period of five or six days. It's so lot. it's like you're tilling the soil <laughs> and, right. then, uh, and then it's a way of watering it. <laughs> I mix my metaphors a little bit there, but you get the idea. And uh, yeah, so then I got hooked on those and I've been doing those retreats ever since now as kind of like a mentor figure on those retreats. And the teachers they have are awesome. I think it's because teachers want to work with young people. Yeah. And so they get the teachers that are sitting the long or teaching the long retreats at IMS or Spirit Rock. And it's not all based in one, one lineage. The pra they're, they practice something called the open secularity where they're not one particular type and they're not saying, hey, this is the truth. This is the way. It's more like, here are some tools, here are some practices. And if you have a religious or spiritual experience, that's also welcome here, whatever. The one dark we all approach. And I found those very influential. And then, yeah, that I don't know where to go from here, but that was kind of now I be me. The I be me world is definitely kind of part of my contemplative practice and my contemplative community and history. Cool. So this had an influence on you for your current work. No. Yeah, definitely. So do you want to get into that? Kind of tell us what it is you're doing now. And yeah. So. The year, I forget the exact year, but while I was in college, 
a funder approached my teacher, Doug, this guy named Gus, no, this guy named Bo Shao, who has a organization called Evolve Foundation. And he approached my teacher, Doug, and essentially said, hey, I love what you're doing here at Middlesex with this idea of there's a bunch of different ways to get mindfulness into schools, but it's unique and it's rare to have a dedicated person hold the role. I want to see if this can scale. And so my teacher, Doug, he found a school down in Texas that had a person who he thought would be a great mindfulness director is what they call them because he had a deep practice background. He had a relationship with the school community. And so basically the puzzle pieces just came together and there's a school Saint, called St. Saint Andrews out down in Austin, Texas. And the mindfulness director there is named Adam Ortmund. And the funder helped kind of grease the wheels of bureaucracy and to get this program off the ground. So he paid 75% of his salary the year one, 50% of the year two, 25% in the year three. So the school had a bit of a trial period and was yeah. taking on more of the salary as they, as the trust was built and the bureaucracy kind of saw the benefits of it. And yeah, they kind of, at that point, successfully launched that position down in Texas. And uh, we were thinking to ourselves, oh my gosh, what if we could start an organization to help Spread uh, this. Problem. You say we, you, Doug, and this. At that funder. point, it was me and John Luke were interning at Inward Bound Mindfulness Education. Okay. And uh, we would kind of sometimes kind of play hooky from work and go hang out and meditate with Doug, who lived down the street from their office. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we were just knocking ideas around. And this was it within the context of, you know, all the challenges that youth are up against now, mental health crisis, attention economy, just their, you know, to be a young person today is to be bombarded and your attention is really just fracked, you know, by these companies with incredibly sophisticated algorithms specifically designed to keep them on their devices, yeah. keep them distracted, disembodied, buying stuff, consuming. The, yeah, the different suicide rates have just skyrocketed yep. yeah for yep. young people it's tragic totally and for me at this point like my relationship with mindfulness was also totally related to community building related to concepts around justice and equity like just this idea of i think we hurt each other when we're not in touch with our own humanity and just a really strong belief that if it's just kind of part of what it means to be educated to have tools to slow down, get in touch with our own humanity, realize each other's humanity, and have the spaciousness to kind of act with a, in, in more in alignment with, with our own values, with our own values, even if they're yeah. different than yours, just more in alignment with values that I think our highest selves want to be in alignment with, then we'll build a better world for everybody. Absolutely. So it was also kind of deeply rooted in that, like, which would really come out in these meditation retreats with IBME. Like it was five or six days, but people would leave in the closing circle saying, I've never felt so much belonging in a community. That was six days long. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I've yeah. never oh. felt so accepted. I've never felt so seen. It wasn't just about meditation, right? It was about people like this little community and this little society that was built within the container of mindfulness but really about so much more. And imagine if schools could look like that. And imagine if that was an orientation that our leaders had when they were going and, and constructing policies and organizations and cultures. So yeah, the, the vision is really about more. It's about mental health, but it's about more than mental health, right? Yeah. Um, okay, so you guys, you're really just in the dream phase right now. In the dream phase. And this funder comes along and, and also Doug's, I think, thinking about the impact he can make, not just on this community, but on the broader space. Sure. He's thinking about scaling too. Yeah. He's thinking about scaling okay. too. And the puzzle pieces come together and it's kind of, it's seeming like an early successful launch of a mindfulness director at a school down in Texas. And yeah, this idea gets formed of 
what if we can launch an organization around this to help spread this mindfulness director model? So it started, I was like just graduating college. I wasn't ready to dive all in to get an organization going. Like we needed someone that knew the education space that had a little more experience. Sure. And so enter this guy named Mark Waxman, who's another co-founder of Whole School Mindfulness. And he has had, he, he at that point had a 25 year Whole School Mindfulness is the organization. Whole School Mindfulness the is the name of the organization. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. Yep. Okay. It started with another name called the Mindfulness Director Initiative, but it's been Whole School for a few years now. And he had been a school teacher. He had been a school principal. He started a couple charter schools. He had a bit of a mindfulness background, a little less, but, you know, a dedication to it and the practices and a real he understanding. recognized of- its value recognized its value and recognized the ways in which it could help heal schools mm-hmm. who, you know, he had been deep in the weeds of our public education system and seeing kind of firsthand the ways in which they're inequitable. They're not serving students. They're not serving the community. I think he might say, yeah. So yeah, he, he was, and, and he also had a deep understanding of how schools work and how schools budgets work. And uh, all that. And he actually applied to become the executive director of Inward Bound Mindfulness Education when Jess was transitioning. And they said, hey, this is not a great fit for you. He hadn't had, had as much to retreat thing experience, but you should talk to my husband, Doug, because he's trying to get this thing going in the education space. So it was really Mark in the first year that got the infrastructure of the organization off the ground. And we helped launch our first mindfulness director position at a school in Shrewsbury, Massachusetts. And so really what that was is we would fundraise and per- generate this pool of catalytic funding so we could partner with a school. And as part of our partnership, we're providing seed funding for the salary of that position. Mm-hmm. So that's really the gist of our model is we help get this position going and change takes money. That's yeah. At the end of the day, if, if you want to shift a system, being well-funded is key. And oftentimes there'll be a person within the school that's super receptive, is a champion, is it's a school leader, it's a superintendent, it's a principal, it's an assistant principal, the head of wellness, whatever, but they want to get this going. And there's a, oftentimes a person who would actually be great at holding that job, which means they have a mindfulness practice, they have some mindfulness teaching experience. And they know the community. And Mm. uh, plus is also if they have trust in the community, like they're that beloved person who everybody knows as somebody who is trustworthy and gets it and people already lock up to him or or them. And uh, maybe they're even doing a little bit of mindfulness. They're leading the mindfulness club, right? Or they're doing a little bit of practice before their math lesson, or they're incorporating it into the way that they implement their SEL curriculum, or they're incorporating it into the way that they our guidance counselor. And what a typical partnership with us looks like is we come in, we provide uh, some funding to grease the wheels of bureaucracy and get something going. And that person can either become a full-time right off the bat mindfulness director. So all their time is directed to mindfulness or a portion, but it's like, Mm. it's not, it's not add on thing on top of an existing course load that's uncompensated. Like it, the idea is that it's, a codified part of their job or it's a codified mm. or it's a codified full job. Yeah. And yeah, we've been going ever since learning a lot, but, and the models uh, tweaked and shifted. And I think we've actually kind of increased our orientation around the intersection of mindfulness and justice and the ways that shows up. Yeah. I realize you have a, you've kind of built that into your framework. So do you train these directors with some kind of model? To yeah, deal with racial injustice in schools, and I mean there there are a few ways that shows up. I would say the first one is who we partner with, right? Because I think there there could be a method where we work with the middle sexes of the world, and we launch a bunch of mindfulness directors and really well funded communities that are mostly white, and hope that the change can kind of spread from there, right? Sure, but. We've taken a commitment rather to, to work with a representative cohort of schools. So 75% of the schools we're partnered with right now 
serve predominantly low income and or students of color. And I think that's really important. Just if we want to, if we want this to influence the system, we've got to start with a representative sample size of the system. And I also just think we're, we're committed to equity in this process. Yeah. Um, so we want to be working with, with those folks. And then there's the ways that when we're selecting for mindfulness directors, because we mindfulness directors apply to be to become part of our cohort. We're looking for mindfulness directors that have an orientation around like if, if, for example, if we had a mindfulness director come to us and say, this is about improving test scores, full stop, <laughs> <Right>. we, we, <laughs> we, that, that just wouldn't score high on our criteria, right? Like, but sure. if, we're, if they're talking about the well-being of their community, if they're talking about the way that this, these practices can build bridges in their community, if we're talking about the Equitable ways. Equitable institutions. Yes. Cool. That, so you're screening for that. We're as screening for that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And now a big part of what we do, especially, we, so we've got 19 mindfulness directors out in the world now. Uh, a big part of what we do is bring them together so mm -hmm. that we have some kind of professional development offerings that we say, hey, we think y'all should know about this. <laughs> so sure. here's some best practices when it comes to being trauma-informed. Here's some best practices when it comes to cultural responsiveness. Here's some best practices around, oh, this person's launch uh, doing this innovative programming. They launch a mindfulness director ambassador program, whatever. But yeah. mostly what we do is just create the space and organization and infrastructure for there to become a community of learners. Mm. So the mindfulness directors are learning from each other. They're swapping best practices. They're doing things like one mindfulness director will say, hey, here are the challenges I'm up against. What do you think? And another mindfulness director can chime in and say, hey, I faced a similar thing. Here's what I did. This worked, this didn't, et cetera. It's, it's really just, you know, these people are on the ground, not just teaching mindfulness, but pioneering a new program. Yeah. And that comes with a lot of difficulties, bureaucratic, cultural resistance, et cetera. And so just to have a space where they can support each other, I think is really key. Yeah. A safe playground. Mm -hmm. You mentioned briefly trauma. That was another question I had for you with these mindfulness directors, you know, yeah. what happens, as you know, like breath is often a common anchor in the beginning to build up some concentration before moving on to the continuous open receptive mindfulness. Mm -hmm. Now that or different parts in the body when children with trauma place their attention there, it can, the trauma can resurface, you know, yeah. or so do you have therapists or other professionals that can step in when needed? Or is there any kind of guidance for those types of situations? Yeah, great question. So yeah, we definitely have resources and training for our mindfulness directors to do what's called tra trauma-informed mindfulness facilitation. So okay. we, you brought up the anchor of breath. I think the, for the vast majority of the time, actually, our mindfulness directors would not start with the anchor of the breath. Sure. And uh, in the interview process. Because they, we hold so much of our emotions and yes. contractions in the chest. Yeah. Totally. Yep. Yep. And you brought up other areas of the body, like, yeah, for example, like leading a body scan, I think focusing on like the genitalia would not be appropriate or trauma sensitive. Right. So but yeah, our mindfulness directors are trained in those techniques and to, and I'm not an expert in my, in, in that area, but the, our mindfulness directors definitely do have resources around that and training around mindful, around trauma. And then also most of the time, our mindfulness directors, not all the time, but are not kind of licensed medical mental health professionals. And right. so there is coordination on the school site between mm. the mindfulness director and the therapist on staff. Right. Uh, okay. Because it's not their role to be doing therapy. Uh, right. The mass majority of the time. So there'll be handoffs and, and heads ups and coordination. And it's a different, it's a different level and it's a different, it's upstream support from yeah. that one on one kind of highly tailored therapeutic support. It's a different, it's a different place in the support structure of well-being at a school site. Yeah. It's, it's actually interesting. It's, I'm just thinking out loud now, but having a mindfulness program in place actually probably 
uncovers a lot of trauma that would otherwise go unnoticed. I don't know if that's the case, but then, right, we can hand it off to a school therapist or kind of open up some of these conversations that otherwise would have been repressed. For yeah. Who knows how long. I know that's true for me. <laughs> really? Yeah. Like it, it can, yeah, it can, I guess in my experience, one of the common misconceptions I think around mindfulness is that people think they had a good mindfulness session if they leave feeling calm, relaxed, yeah. insert positive meditative word. Yeah. But I don't think that's true at all. Sometimes no. you got to feel it to heal it, man. Exactly. Like sometimes it's a matter of, hey, I, I had this thing come up and I just let it do its thing. Anger, yeah. sadness, grief, whatever. And it, it's not necessarily pleasant, but I'd rather have that stuff move through me, you know, yeah. rather than get locked in. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah, I, I'll piggyback on that because I think it is a common misconception that a lot of people when they practice meditation, they're almost seeking, which is the opposite of kind of this spiritual practice. So they're looking for peak states and yeah. trying to hold on to those. And, you know, it's great. Peak states are, they're great. But mm -hmm. to grasp onto them, you know, that's the opposite of what we're trying to do with this practice. It's to let everything pleasant, unpleasant, neutral to come in close, you know, hold it with compassion, see it, understand it, and let it go. Yeah. So yeah, the good, bad sit. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the sit's going to be super painful emotionally, physically, and great. Were you there? Were you open, receptive? It's a great sit. Yeah, totally. Yeah. I'm lucky in that my, my concentration is not and has never really been at the point where I've had many peak states to cling on to. <laughs> so I haven't been allured by the, but I totally know what you mean. Like the, the chasing the, the jhanas or the chasing of, exactly, the, yeah. of these different states of like total unity. And jhanas is for listeners. It's kind of a deep concentration and absorption state. When you get that concentrated, it can lead to extremely pleasant feelings, rapturous feelings. Anyway. Yeah. And maybe I've been in the neighborhood of that, but sure. I haven't had a, I haven't had those experiences in any deeper sustained way. Yeah. So I haven't, luckily for me, the kind of state chasing hasn't been a big part of my practice. Cool. Okay. So if people are interested, listeners are interested in either supporting your work, whether they can donate or if they're interested in becoming a mindfulness director yeah what guidance do you have where where could you yeah or before? maybe you have some school leaders uh, or some active involved parents and so yeah there's kind of there's a few different ways if you like what we're about and you want to support us so if you're listening to this and you're in a school connected to a school and saying oh my gosh this is my dream job i didn't know this could even be a job yeah we want to partner with you for sure to help try to get something going. And so each year we release a mindfulness director application and you would apply to us with a letter from your school. But anyways, check us out. Go to our website. So you release this on your website? It's on our website. Join our newsletter, which will be a little pop-up on our newsletter, uh, on our website. And our we have four partners at Whole School Mindfulness and uh so the person who runs our mindfulness director recruitment, her name is Selena Coyasso. And so there's even a way probably on our website or via emailing her to schedule a little 15 minute chat with her cool. to learn more about that opportunity. And you, I can embed the links to the introduction to this podcast. Sweet. Yeah. Wholeschoolmindfulness.org. And same thing if you're a school administrator that wants to get, help launch a mindfulness director in your school. We would love to partner with you and have that conversation. Check us out. And then, yeah, if you're listening to this and you want to help add some momentum to this movement of really integrating mindfulness into our education system in this way, uh, it does take money to move systems. And yeah. your money, if, if you donate to us, your money will go to launching and supporting mindfulness directors straight up.
and you know the organization behind that. So we're always looking, we're always fundraising given the nature of our model where we yeah. provide catalytic funding and free training. So we're definitely dependent on fundraising and it's always appreciated. Yeah, well, I love what you're doing. Listeners, please, yeah, if the, you're interested in this at all, please do some research and consider. Yeah, thanks, anyway, John. Yeah, Ben, it's been a real pleasure listening to your background, and I love the work you're doing. If I can support you in any way, please stay in touch. Let me know. Yeah, right um, back at you. Right back at you. Thank you so much for, for your curiosity. And it, yeah, yeah. It was nice to be, it's, it's nice to be seen. Huh? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, guys, Ben, immediately upon meeting him, he's spoken in this podcast about people that embody certain qualities. Ben embodies safety, loving kindness, (laughs) just a real care in people. It just, it hits you hard as soon as you're in your presence. It's this cloud of just, ah, okay, I, I can be at ease. So nice of you to say. Yeah, right back at you. Yeah, another podcast or another conversation off mics. We definitely got to talk about Lock Kelly a little bit more. And yeah, I'd love to hear about your background a little more too. For sure. Yeah. Well, hey, thanks again, Ben.